this year. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Springtime Wolverine Caucus Forum. Uh, we're excited to see all of you today. And uh, we are also happy that we are generously supported by the UM Alumni Association, the UM Office of Government Relations, and we are being filmed by Mike Blondie, formerly of Michigan Government Television. But most importantly, we appreciate all of you taking time to join us today. And we appreciate the speaker who you're about to hear, uh, who has helped start businesses all over Michigan and indeed the world. And it is wonderful when our faculty take time to offer their information for our use. And uh, we just are so glad that you're here. Wanted to acknowledge Representative Andrew Kendrivas, who will be introducing our speaker, Representative Hovey Wright, Representative Potvin, Representative Zimke, and also former Lieutenant Governor John Cherry and Jeff Mason from the University Research Corridor. Without further ado, want to welcome Representative Kendrivas to this podium. He's from the 13th District, the great city of Southgate, and an appropriations member in the Michigan House of Representatives. Good Thank to you. see you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody, for... Well, don't, don't applaud me, because um, I feel that I haven't done anything compared to the, 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 the presenter that you're going to hear after me. Um, I am Andrew Candrevis, Go Blue, class of 97 from LSNA. Um, and uh, I am here, been asked and and these are great lecture series, and I see a lot of familiar faces, so it's great that you could come out today. You know, today uh, we have Jim Price with us, and Jim Price is an entrepreneur, a business educator, and an author. For the past decade, he has been a faculty member at the University of Michigan Ross School of Business, and he serves on the executive committee of the Zalluri Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies. Professor Price is an innovative entrepreneur, a CEO who has led the development of multiple technologically enabled businesses in Michigan. His efforts have created hundreds of high paying jobs, successful shareholder liquidity events, including an initial public offering and several company mergers and sales. His national thought leadership on entrepreneurship and innovation is showcased on his blogs on Business Insider and the Huffington Post. At this time, please help me warmly introduce and invite to the Wolverine Caucus, Professor Jim Price. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks so much for having me here and, and for taking the time out of your busy days to, to join us. Uh, let's not make this a lecture. Let's make this a conversation. Uh, and, uh, and, and the big question that was posed to me originally was, how do we keep Wolverine entrepreneurs here in Michigan. So I stepped back and I thought about that. Hmm. I, I've been teaching uh, entrepreneurship at, at the Ross School of Business to, uh, at, at the MBA level for going on 11 years now. I thought about that topic and I said, no, that's not quite the right topic. What about how do we keep young entrepreneurs in Michigan? You know, then I thought about that and I said, well, does 50-something qualify as young? Because I want to be included. Um, I, I see some nods out there from my compadres. Um, how do we keep young and uh, uh, modified young entrepreneurs in Michigan and attract those who have left back? Okay, this is getting interesting. Well, let, let's simplify this. Placemaking for entrepreneurs in Michigan. What is placemaking? A lot of you are familiar with this term used in other ways. The concept that people choose to live in places that offer the amenities, the resources, the social and professional networks, and the opportunities to support thriving lifestyles. That's placemaking. Why do I want to come to Michigan to live? Why do I want to stay in Michigan as a place to live, to raise my children, to retire, and so on? 
So let's define our terms. What is an entrepreneur? Okay, entrepreneur. Entrepreneur. It is a French noun. Okay. Um, it's an individual who starts a business and by doing so uh, creates employment for her or himself and others. So I, I'm, I'm creating a, 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 or offering up a fairly tight definition there. Uh, so let's say that uh, we're going to define out of this realm uh, of entrepreneurship people who are just working in their PJs for themselves. Uh, you know, out of their spare bedroom. So, so let's call entrepreneurs for this discussion people who actually start businesses and create a job for at least one other person, okay, for this discussion. Placemaking for entrepreneurs, then let's call that creating an environment comprised of business, social, economic, policy, physical, and virtual characteristics and initiatives that makes a place attractive for entrepreneurs to start and grow their businesses. Okay, so how do we do place making for entrepreneurs here in Michigan? Are we doing it already? I think so. But here's the problem, and, and we've talked about this statewide for quite some time. We've talked about it from a business perspective, we've talked about it from a policy perspective, uh, we've talked about it from a social perspective. We've got a brain drain. Uh, we produce, uh, we, we both hatch, produce, and then we, uh, we, we create uh, we, uh, people through our, our uh, university system, an awful lot of really smart people. We train smart people and a lot of them leave. Where do they go? Well, they, there's the concept of diaspora. Uh, you've got people from a given country or a different ethnicity who go other places in the world. Well, there's the Michigan, University of Michigan, the Wolverine diaspora. Where do these folks go? It's interesting. They go to a few select places, you'll find. And I, I uh, stepped back in preparation for this conversation and looked at a number of uh, U of M career development office statistics, and I'll share some of those with you, because I'm a nerd, um, and I love statistics. Uh, so, um, and they go to Illinois, they go to Texas, they go to California, they go to the state of Washington, they go to New York, um, and the tri-state area around New York City, and they go to the eastern seaboard. Uh, so concentrated around uh, the Washington, D.C. area and from Boston right down to D.C., okay? So let's drill down and, and look at, at how this works. So I mentioned that if we look at uh, career development office statistics from different programs, and, and what I did was I selected different educational programs at U of M that produce folks who are, um, who are particularly likely to be starting businesses and particularly well qualified to do so. And, and it's not just out of U of M, but if you look broadly at who starts startups around the US. Um, there are people from MBA programs, they are people from uh, engineering programs, and not just any engineering program, but computer science, electrical engineering. So I focused in on those, those places. So first let's look at, at uh, the MBA program. Where do people go? Well, they go to the Midwest, that's over here, to the West, and, and let's, uh, let's look particularly at where they go. Uh, the Midwest, but, but it's mostly not Michigan, it's to Chicago and Minneapolis. And what's interesting anecdotally is the folks I know who stick around in Michigan, an awful lot of them are sticking around, uh, the, they'll tell you, well, I'm waiting for my fiance to graduate from the School of Public Policy or from the dental school, and as, she, as soon as she graduates, then we're going to move to fill in the blank. 
So they stick around for a year. So, so even the 19 or 20 percent who stick around in Michigan, that's a little bit of a red herring because it's less than that if you look out a couple of years, and I don't have those statistics. Then about uh, half of the people go to the West Coast and the East Coast each year, and, and, that, and that varies up and down. Sometimes it's well over half. Uh, sometimes a good third go to the West Coast, and it depends on how the job offers look and, and who's starting businesses out in Silicon Valley and so on and so forth. Okay, let's look at the engineering programs. Start with uh, a BS or bachelor's in engineering, the BSE. Um, and it's interesting, the top seven states. You can imagine with bachelors, there are more people coming out at age 21, 22 uh, who stick around close to home, uh, who stick around Michigan. Um, and that's great. So we get among the bachelors, and by the way, you get a lot more people coming out of the bachelor's program who are pulled into our, our wonderful automotive companies. Uh, but, but let's zoom in on these statistics. Um, somewhere uh, between 20 and 25 percent year in and year out go to these two states, to Illinois and Ohio. Hmm. Uh, how do we feel about that? Um, I, no editorial comment here. Uh, and uh, a, a good quarter to a third year in and year out go to... Um, to the West Coast or the Southwest, and specifically to three states, Washington, California, Texas. And you're gonna see this over and over again, Washington, California, Texas. So we just looked at BS engineering, now look at MS engineering job acceptances, top seven states. Okay, now these are master's degree students, fewer of them stick around in Michigan, and where do the other ones go? A uh, little bit less Ohio, okay, but but uh, it's Illinois, Indiana. Hmm, how do we feel about that? Washington, California, Texas. Brain drain. Hmm, okay. So we've looked at MBA, BS Engineering, MS Engineering, MS Information. We've got the number one ranked school in the country in, in this area of basically information architecture, which is th these folks have uh, third degree black belts in designing anything from websites to <coughs> mobile apps, and they are in huge demand. Where do they end up going? Well, happily, a third of them stick around in Michigan, and, and I'm just uh, showing you uh, the most recent year for which I could get statistics, but I went back several years for the MSI or uh, uh, MS in information degree, and I found that it was pretty consistent. But look at this, uh, one quarter to the West Coast, pretty consistently one quarter to the East Coast. Hmm, okay, so we're seeing patterns here. So we've got that brain drain, the good news and there is good news is we get to keep a lot of these people. The bad news is we see an awful lot of our good, super smart people leave. So let's, let's take the plane back up to 30,000 feet, look at the big picture and ask ourselves, is there a place for, I, I couldn't resist, a place for placemaking uh, for entrepreneurs here in Michigan. I think there is, but let's talk about this. So we've, we've looked at that Michigan, University of Michigan diaspora. Where do these people go? And, and I haven't touched on those who, who head overseas, but most of those are foreigners who, who came from overseas to get a degree here and went back, yes. I, I have not, the, unfortunately, yeah, unfortunately we don't have, uh, the, the statistics aren't kept that way at the offices of career development, so there, there isn't a one-to-oneness 
uh, of those stats? That, and, and that's a very good point. Uh, so how many of these people are going, are, are heading back to Manhattan because that's where I was raised, are, are heading back to Boston because uh, that's where my family is located? And unfortunately, our statistics do not show that. And, and it's very important to note that, especially at the graduate level, but, but absolutely at the undergraduate level, we are a national university. And so it, it's, uh, it's something we, we can't stick our head in the sand about that. Uh, so that's an absolutely good point. Uh, something that is very interesting to note, uh, sort of the other side of that coin, is that it is amazing how many people come from elsewhere, come to Ann Arbor to go to school. And um, I, I've had the, the, the wonderful good fortune of, of having uh, now over 1,400 MBAs from all around the world take my uh, elective course in uh, entrepreneurial business planning. Um, and, and so now over 10 years, they've scattered all over the world. Um, it's, it's amazing how many of them, very few of them in the MBA program are from, uh, from the state of Michigan. It's amazing how many of them tell me they would love to come back and live in Michigan, live in Ann Arbor, for what it's worth. Um, so th that's the other side of that coin, is that we have an opportunity uh, to, to get people, whether they be foreigners or U.S. citizens, uh, to attract very talented Wolverines who may not have been born and raised in Novi, Rochester, Grand Blanc, to attract them back here, even if they were raised in Palo Alto or the Texas Panhandle. Um, but absolutely good point. Yes? Is your course available as a MOOC? It's not available as a MOOC. Um, I, I've been considering that. So with this Michigan diaspora, how do we make them want to stay as they're coming out of their various degree programs, undergrad and grad? And then let's, let's ask ourselves, how do we attract them back? And this could be a couple years later. It could be 30 years later. How do we attract them back and specifically, if we're talking about placemaking for entrepreneurs, how do we attract them back to start a business, to, to start and build a business? Now, you're all familiar with the statistics that, that between 75 and 80 percent of, of new jobs created in the U.S. are created by small businesses. So this is important. This is very important to us as Wolverines. This is very important to us as Michiganders to ask this question of, of not just keeping the hot, smart ones who are coming out of school, but attracting back the grizzled veterans, whether they've been grizzled by three years of experience or by 22 years of experience, back from wherever they've been to start their next business or maybe their first business back here in Michigan. How do we do that? Something that's kind of interesting is that um, this is not your father's US. This is not your father's Michigan. Uh, uh, that we, we, unlike my dad, who was part of the greatest generation, fought in World War II, uh, went to school on the GI Bill, got a job at Eastman Kodak, worked there for life, and retired with a pension. You know, uh, even we boomers uh, aren't able to do that. And you know what? The people I'm teaching now are absolutely not able to expect that. Uh, look at these statistics. Um, in a longitudinal survey done for people who are already middle-aged, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor, Labor Statistics uh, uh, says that an average of 11 jobs is what the average American has between the ages of 18 and 44. Um, and the, the length of a job, and a job is defined as uh, being uh, on, on the job full-time with uh, a single employer, so you can be 
kind of having different job titles. I can move up from individual contributor to first level supervisor, but it's still a job. Uh, that average hasn't changed a whole lot, interestingly enough, uh, since the mid-90s. It's about four years, give or take. But here's what's interesting is if you're thinking about if we're thinking about bringing people back here into the state of Michigan, well, I've got a really good job here in Texas. I've got a really good job here in White Plains, uh, in New York. Well, you know, that's probably going to last another two and a half years if you've been there a year and a half. Uh, so, Maureen, you might want to consider in two and a half years, you know, let's set our watches or our iPhones because um, you might want to consider planning on coming back here because none of these things really last. Um, okay, let's keep the plane up at, at, at I, I'm, I'm sort of painting a picture here. Keep the plane up at 30,000 feet. If we're going to do placemaking, uh, it helps to look at, at what people need. Um, and uh, let's start with Maslow's hierarchy of need. Uh, and most of us ha have seen this before. Uh, you start out with physiological, then safety, then love and belonging, then esteem, and finally self-actualization. That has nothing to do with anything. I just wanted to put that slide up here. Okay, because it's cool. Uh, but, but in all seriousness, then based on that, I made up uh, Jim's hierarchy of need for entrepreneurs. Um, and it starts out with survival at the bottom, just like Maslow's, but then I got uh, progressively dumber, and it goes to cash, belonging, traction, and self-actualization. Unlike Maslow, I have no mention of sex in mine. I, I just want to note that, uh, because we're here in Lansing and we're all buttoned up. Um, so you start out with survival. Can I breathe? Can I afford to do this? Can I afford to start a business? Am I qualified even to do this? I, you, a, a lot of times when I, when I talk to people who are thinking about starting a business for the first time, I, 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 I swear they're kind of physically short of breath. <laughs> Jim, can I talk to you? I, I, I'm really scared about this. Then cash. Can I even turn the lights on? Is there any cash at all? Is there any oxygen in the room? Then belonging, are there lots of people around here, wherever here is, who do this sort of thing? Does this feel good? Um, because you, you like to be surrounded by people, if you will, who, who look like you, who, who are moving and dancing like you, who are doing the kind of stuff you do. Um, and then finally, traction. Am I moving my business forward and self-actualization? Is, is, does this have the jazz? Is it fun? Um, but you know, if we're going to create a sense of, uh, of place here in Michigan for entrepreneurs, and I think we're already doing it to some extent, we need to start by focusing, I would say, on these bottom three these bottom three tiers of survival, cash, and belonging. I'd like to start with belonging and, and just ask the question, how are we doing? You know, this is a really cool place to live. And, and I'm saying this, I mean, there, there are lots of places in Michigan and a lot of us, you know, experience different aspects of the state. Um, I, I think that people who have experienced Michigan, I, I don't think we have anything to worry about here. Um, and I think we're doing a lot of the right things, not only in terms of uh, just the, the, the simple, the obvious lifestyle stuff, but, but also you can be in, you know, I happen to be an Ann Arborite, um, but of course I lived uh, in Silicon Valley, I lived in Boston, I mean, I, uh, uh, Andrew didn't tell you that. I mean, I, I'm, a, I'm a coastal guy who moved here to what the coastal people sometimes call flyover country 25 years ago, stayed, raised my children, 
um, I'm, I'm going to be here for the rest of my life um, because this is cool. Um, and, um, and that is weird. What happened? Okay. Um, I love computers. Um, can you tell I'm a tech entrepreneur? I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have, uh, this is a, an inside shot of the Madison building in downtown Detroit where, you know, they, there's all kinds of, of cool startups uh, working around each other. Um, uh, we've got the Center for Entrepreneurship uh, with, with a, another incubator uh, in the heart of Ann Arbor. Uh, we have continually churned to create a, a better and better sense of place. Um, I actually have a shot of Sweetwaters here in downtown Ann Arbor. Sweetwaters and Cafe Zola across the street. Um, it, it's really interesting uh, when you have coffee or breakfast at one of those places, it's not unusual to be... Uh, in the same room with about 15 entrepreneurs and or venture capitalists. I mean, it's amazing. It, it's sort of deal central. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I sit there to do some of my writing for my blog and, um, and, and people just come up to you, introduce themselves, uh, you know, Jeff will introduce me to somebody and, and it's, it's just great connections. Uh, belonging. We are doing a really good job of, as students are coming out of grad school, as students are coming out of undergrad, as they're going through these programs, they're experiencing the fact that, wow, uh, some of them express surprise, which, which is fine. I'm surprised at how vibrant the startup scene seems to be around here. You know, I didn't know this. I mean, this is kind of like, this is kind of like Boulder, dude. You know, it's, yeah, whatever, you know. It's actually like Michigan, but, uh, you know, Boulder is kind of like Michigan. Uh, but, uh, you know, we've got, just got a lot of vibrancy. There are a lot of programs uh, that are, are just popping up all the time. I knew we were doing a lot of things right when I started about five years ago, getting students coming up to me, MBA students, and telling me, uh, Jim, I, I'm going to have to skip class on Monday because I'm going to some entrepreneurship conference that I hadn't heard about that's going on in downtown Detroit, up in Lansing, and that there's so much stuff going on that and they felt that that was more important for the startup that they were starting in my class than attending my class. Now, yes, I was, French term, pissed off. But, you know, I'm thinking, uh, the other half of my brain is thinking, how cool is this? There's an entrepreneurial ecosystem uh, on campus with the Center for Entrepreneurship, um, uh, up on North Campus uh, with the College of Engineering. Uh, the Office of Tech Transfer is doing an amazing job uh, creating a, a vibrant system that not only helps basically inventor professors figure out how to spin out companies and, and uh, find the tools and, uh, and some of the business expertise uh, with which to do so, uh, but but a lot of the uh, a lot of the nurturing and and uh, and training and orientation for that. Um, I'm on the board of the of the Zell Lurie Institute, which is in the Ross School of Business. Um, we have a new uh, Masters of Entrepreneurship that's a joint program between uh, the engineering school and the business school, uh, so people can come straight out of typically an engineering undergrad, get a one-year degree, and come out with a, a black belt in entrepreneurship. Um, and, and so on and so on and so on. There, there, there are a number of, of programs. Let me just highlight one more. The Michigan Growth Capital Symposium, uh, which is having, I'm going to get the number wrong, it's something like it's 31st or 33rd annual um, uh, two-day fest uh, next month. 
The Michigan Growth Capital Symposium was one of the very first venture capital conferences in the country uh, and has helped uh, companies that, startup companies come and, and pitch their deals uh, to venture capitalists and angel groups who come and who come there from around the country, but primarily around the Midwest, to because they know that quality deals are going to be pitched by CEOs of startup companies at the Michigan Growth Capital Symposium, which takes place in Ypsilanti each year. Um, yes. Good question. Uh, the, the, the Masters in Entrepreneurship is, uh, is oriented very much toward, um, toward people with a technology undergrad background. And sometimes they have a, a, even a Masters, a couple of them have PhDs in the, in the charter class. We've only had one class this year. So it's a brand new program. Um, and um, so it's oriented toward people with a tech background uh, who have no orientation toward business. They wouldn't know a business if it bit them in the you-know-what. Uh, and, and so uh, the, idea, the, the idea is that many of them actually going into the program um, are very much interested in uh, starting a business um, have ideas about inventions that they would like to move forward uh, in an entrepreneurial setting, but they have no idea what questions to ask. And so uh, what the one-year program does is give them, if you will, a pocket MBA. Uh, it, it's sort of MBA light training and orientation on uh, um, uh, on how to develop a business plan, how to pitch your idea, and, and frameworks for building a business. Does that help? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So that's belonging uh, in um, Jim's hierarchy of need uh, for entrepreneurs. And then w what about cash and survival? How are we doing? Well. Here are two issues uh, that I'd like to zoom in on. One of them uh, that I think is the principal uh, constraint to keeping good people uh, here in Michigan and getting them to start their business idea as a business right away. Well, I'm, I'd love to, but I'm graduating with 25,000, you fill in the blank, 25,000 to, if they're a graduate student, as much as $200,000, because they still have their undergraduate uh, student loans, right? Um, uh, if we're a couple, we have both our undergraduate student loans. Uh, you've been supporting me through grad school, and, and so there, they're looking at me and saying, okay, professor, do you want to go and explain to my significant other that I'm not taking the, the job with the really good pay and the signing bonus so that I can start a business with no pay for an indefinite period of time? Do you want to explain that to my significant other? Because I'm not going to. Um, and, and, and so the, the, that student loan overhang is, is a really serious issue. It's a really serious issue, and they, they feel like they need to go get a job job. Um, that's a technical term. Uh, uh, the issue number two, I, I've never done this before. You know, sort of the, the issue that the, uh, the Masters in Entrepreneurship tries to address, but even the people coming out of the MBA program have a real set of nerves about that, uh, so please reassure me that I can pull it off and give me a place to sit. Give me a river guide, somebody who's got the entrepreneurship bones who can, who can be a mentor. So as, as we keep flying, flying across this issue, here are some things that, that we are already doing, and sorry for the clutter on this slide. 
I, I am really terrible at, at making slides. I, you know, first of all, I, I'd like you to admire the way I draw with a rock when I do my, my curves. I mean, this is, uh, as my teenager says, you really suck, Dad. Uh, thank you. I, uh, so, uh, but we, we provide a, a, a lot of sources of funding for startups here in the state. Uh, but between us, we kind of have to do this because unlike in places like Silicon Valley, uh, and there are a few select places around the country, Silicon Valley, uh, Austin, Boston, New York City, uh, Boulder, there are a few select places around the country that are high-tech startup hotspots. Unlike those places, we don't have a super vibrant venture capital and angel capital community. Angels are high net worth individuals. They usually band together and invest together in early stage startups. So this is time going across this axis. This is revenue for the startup. So when there is no revenue, uh, there's this undocumented law of physics that if, if, you are, um, if you are desperate, you're not gonna be able to raise money. If you are rich, everybody will be tripping over themselves to give you money. I mean, it, 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 it's just ridiculous. It, it's sort of like, uh, you know, if you have uh, five dates to the prom, people are gonna be knocking on your door, offering you more dates to the prom. It's like, where were you when I was desperate? It, anyway, I'll stop. Um, so, you, what we do is, uh, here in Michigan, is we have a wonderful program called the Michigan Pre-Seed Capital Fund, which offers up to $50,000 microloans, and then up to $250,000 uh, matching investments. That is, you have to find somebody else, and usually it's uh, an angel investor or investors, high net worth individuals, but it could be a corporate investor, a strategic investor, to match that at least one for one in order to raise that next 200 to 250 in the matching investment from the Michigan Pre-Seed Fund. Um, the uh, Dare to Dream grants are up to $10,000 coming from the Zellurie Institute to uh, MBA-led uh, teams to help them uh, get their idea off the ground, so that's very early on. Uh, the Wolverine Venture Fund and the Frankel Fund are both student-led funds uh, at, the, uh, at the Ross School of Business uh, within uh, the Zellurie Institute. Um, let's see, um, the, the Venture Fund, uh, Venture Fund Michigan, one and two, um, are, uh, was created by the state to invest in, um, in uh, venture capital firms that are either based here or have offices here in the state of Michigan. So they could be based in uh, Boston or the West Coast or wherever, but they have to commit. Uh, if we, the state of Michigan, invest in one of their funds, they have to open an office here in Michigan and maintain an office here, which is great and work hard to do deals here, to invest in startup companies here. Um, and, and so w we have uh, some uh, early stage investment capital available uh, for startups here. Now I put a red X through some of this because if you are a very early stage company or thinking as a student, either a grad student or an undergrad student about starting your business. What you're desperately interested in, think about that, that hierarchy of need. Uh, can I even breathe? Do I have enough cash to even consider starting this and not taking a job, going on the recruiting trail uh, uh, at the Office of Career Development and getting a job job, right? Um, what I'm worried about is, is not can I raise venture capital once I, once I've built the company, I have employees, I, I have uh, uh, 
launched my, uh, my product, I have paying customers, I have revenue coming into the company. Oh man, that, that is so far out in the future. What I'm worried about is, can I even get started? And, and that's way back here. Uh, that's when I, we're a pre-revenue company. Heck, we're not even a company. So, so we're thinking about this, uh, what, what in, in venture capital parlance are called pre-seed investments. Um, is anybody willing to, to put up a little bit of money uh, in order to enable me to, and, or maybe my, my partner and me, uh, to start this, this business, this venture? Um, and that's a very hard thing to do if you don't have uh, basically wealthy parents and and the vast majority of us don't uh, because you know there's an expression of when when you're when you're back here uh, starting a business the venture capitalists say well you raise that money from F F and F what's that friends family and fools <laughs> because they're the only people who are willing to invest in your shining face and a startup business plan but that's all you've got and I'm thinking, well, that kind of stinks for those of us who don't have any wealth in the family, doesn't it? And so having some kind of an ecosystem where we, we enable those, those students uh, to start something, how do we do that? Um, the, there is uh, an Accelerate Michigan uh, uh, competition, which is fantastic for the, the winners of that competition uh, receive uh, cash awards that help fund uh, their startup. The Great Lakes Entrepreneurs Quest, same sort of thing. Uh, so these really do help and, and they are absolutely key enablers. And incubators and accelerators. So. If you look at, it's not just cash, it's all about creating a sense of place, about figuring out, do I have the river guides, as I was referring to them earlier? Do I have people with whom I can work who have actually been there and done that? Um, and, uh, and one of the best things in the world that we do here in Michigan are these things called smart zones. We've got, how many of them do we have? 15? Uh, uh, all over the state. Um, the, the majority of them, if not all of them, operate uh, small business incubators at their facilities and they basically are powerful enablers for startups. Uh, we also have uh, incubators hosted at universities and some of these are also associated with smart zones. Okay, so what's missing? What's still missing? And, and here I'd like to turn this over to, uh, to discussion. Um, tuition incentives, think about that student loan debt overhang. You know, um, the average for people coming out of undergraduate school, yes, is $25,000 uh, coming out of the University of Michigan. But if you look at graduate school, it's a lot, lot more than that because they're still carrying their undergraduate loans as well as, um, you know, it's $55,000 just for tuition and fees uh, to, for out of state to, to go to um, the Ross School of Business, for instance. So could, could we have, um, and, and let me stay on that for a second. <clears throat> there are some states that are now uh, offering some kind of uh, debt relief for student loans for students who decide to launch a business in their state. Um, and and uh, it can take the form of just um, covering their, um, for two or three years, the first two or three years that you're launching your business, uh, just covering your interest payments. And uh, there has to be some kind of a contractual arrangement between uh, the state agency and the individual or her or his um, uh, organization uh, startup. Something else, uh, 
web and social uh, social network resources for alumni. Um, I happen to, to operate a, uh, a a LinkedIn group uh, with about 900 people who uh, of the 1,400 who have taken my course um, in new venture creation at the Ross School, but. I literally have five conversations a week with people who have graduated who are doing things in anywhere from Kansas City to Palo Alto and London uh, who still want my advice and could be lurable back here. Um, and I don't have the bandwidth, but what if we had a vibrant network put together that was uh, that w had user contributed content from these great intrapreneurs and entrepreneurs in the the greater Wolverine network, uh, and they were supporting each other, and being and this could be contributed to by uh, uh, people like myself and Len Middleton and others. Um, uh, at the university who have an interest in some expertise in entrepreneurship. Um, other ideas? Thoughts? Um, please, and, and then we'll move on. This is just an observation, but the attractiveness of places like Texas and California isn't necessarily static. Texas will have water supply problems. It has a very poor education system. Austin is nearly as attractive as it used to be as a uh, living destination. California has just enacted huge income tax increases, so I wouldn't necessarily think of those destinations as always being attractive. I think that's fair. Um, I have some thoughts and a comment. Um, uh, I teach community college business. Mm -hmm. and. Um, Right now, we're in the process of working on a final where students are putting together their own businesses from scratch. My concern or my question is, I feel that by the time you get to undergrad, it's too late to be thinking entrepreneurially, and we don't really train our minds to think outside of going get the job job, like you said. So what types of things is the university doing to address this from a, a high school and or middle school level, especially when you're tying in the IT and science and technology into um, business ventures so that when a young person gets to college, they're not necessarily thinking just, I'm going to get my degree, but I'm also thinking about how can I take these things I've learned early on and use them for business opportunities, which I think is a lot different. I, I, I'm personally not familiar with programs uh, that the, the U of M is involved with. I, I don't know if you are, Cynthia, uh, uh, that, that are are pre-bachelors outreach? I some that are pre-bachelors, but I, I do know from our statistical data that we evaluate every year uh, on incoming class of students that are freshmen excited to be at the university. But we find that about 10% are already uh, engaged in some kind of entrepreneurial activity. Some of it is supported with um, you know, their high school uh, math course or something along the lines of Yeah. 
Yeah. The K-12 schools? Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yeah, they've done a great job running this contest, but uh, they have only really a couple of schools who really pay attention to it. Even though they're they're offering cash prizes, once on one one. Um, and so it's a really good program, but the schools still kind of don't necessarily see it as part of their responsibility. I don't know. Mm -hmm. they, they don't value it. It's just they've got other things to focus on. So, Mm-hmm. One other thing I wanted to underline about Austin is um, they do nonetheless have a great South by Southwest conference. And I think about a web designer that we're trying to recruit back here who used to be in Lansing and got pulled down there for that event and a number of years ago decided he wanted to stay. So I think we also want to think about what are the national level magnet events that we can have that would pull entrepreneurs back into that's a great thought. Uh, pull young people back here to talk about the business opportunities, the things that they can experience, uh, and make it a fun and exciting uh, event. Yeah, we, we uh, at the Ross School, we send down, um, I don't know how many busloads of people to South by Southwest over winter break. And they're, they're going down supposedly to listen to... Uh, to uh, tech entrepreneurs make presentations, I think that's a lot of crap. They're going down to party and, 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 listen, and listen to the great concerts. And, and they come back with their eyes, you know, this big around saying, that is such a cool place. It's, it's place making. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and it's place making for young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurially, creatively minded people. Yeah. Just out of curiosity, to go back to the 11 jobs that people have had, does that include like summer employment or is it really for professional type jobs or longer term jobs? According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, that, that is uh, job jobs. So it's not including. Uh, my job as a lifeguard over the summer after after high school. I checked with them on that. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about your saying we're still missing here, and I, and I guess, you know, we're talking a lot of things, they're great ideas, but for people who might want to invest in the friends, family, pools types, I mean, I think the fear is that you're, you know, you're going to lose your money, and I'm not sure if there's any um, way of mitigating Yes, I mean, it, that's, that's another good thought. Um, there are approaches to, um, uh, to basically protecting uh, angel investors or, or providing uh, a, a tax policy approach that can, uh, that can help provide favorable treatment to uh, angel investors. But angel investors are already... Well, it, it, what um, what the SEC, you know, what, what the SEC uh, established back in the 70s was that um, was they defined um, uh, a, a, an accredited investor as someone who has it was an and or definition that um, the individual has. 200,000 or higher in annual income, or at least, I think it was $1 million in, <coughs> in total assets, but that can include your home. Um, and, um, and they haven't changed that since 1973. Um, and, and so the definition of, of, of wealth, uh, that was 
wealthy in 73, and it, it, it hasn't been revised. And so you've got a lot of people um, making investments now, mom and dad making investments in their kids' startups who probably shouldn't be. Uh, you know, you just mentioned brief in place, and, and it seems like there's been a lot of discussion about young people moving to a place and then deciding what their job is or what their business yes. job is, as opposed to, well, I'm here in Michigan, where can I look for of cash? It seems like we, you know, do you find that true? I mean, do you think people are still doing that? And, and if that's the, it's the situation, then it seems like we've got an awful lot of work to do to create a Chicago, or Minneapolis, or San Francisco, or New York, here in Michigan, can indeed attract them. Well, I, I, I think you have to start somewhere, and, um, and and I think there's a good watchword in life, let's not try to be someone that we're not. Um, uh, we're not going to change everything overnight, and, and I, I think the place to start is by concentrating on uh, people who are already interested, A, in being here or staying here, and B, who already have a startup idea. Yep. Jim, I was just, in terms of uh, you know, fundraising, maybe you can touch for a second on you know, Kiva, Kickstart, and some of the crowdfunding options that sure. are out there now. Uh, then also, I'm, I'd be curious, you know, in, in your 10 years and 1,400 MBA students that yep. have gone through your classes. I mean, when you talk to them, either as they're going through the program or after, you know, what are what are some of the reasons that they have either uh, been drawn to either stay in Michigan mm -hmm. or or leave Michigan? And, and have you seen any of those reasons or you know, kind of that environment change over that you know last decade? Um. There, there is a, a real draw to the, oh. I knew that. Uh, th there's a real draw to, um, uh, for whatever reason, and, and I've, I've seen this all my life since before I moved here, to being on the coasts. And, and it's... Uh, a young people thing that drives me nuts now that I live where I do, but it is what it is. Um, and, and there's a clustering effect uh, that, that occurs uh, where, well, you know, 45 or 145 of my buddies are all moving to the San Francisco Bay Area or fill in the blank. And so won't that be cool? Uh, Chicago is like that, I know, for... Uh, in Minneapolis for people uh, coming out of the Ross School of Business, the Bay Area is like that, those three places. Um, it's difficult to overcome that. Um, and th there is also a, um, uh, I, I think the, the reason people stay here uh, starts with uh, wanting to be either uh, in a particular town um, and or wanting to be near family um, and or um, I've got my significant other and she's still got three years left in dental school or fill in the blank. And I say, let's take advantage of that. Uh, it's not a negative, it's a positive. Uh, any of those things. What I find when I was talking to somebody, um, a, a guy named Ben, uh, yesterday for about 45 minutes, and he had just sold his um, his second business. His first business he, he started uh, after graduating in 2005. He sold it in 2007 for 17 million. He's out in Silicon Valley. Uh, sold his second business to Facebook for 80 million. Um, he and his wife would are, grew up in southeast Michigan. They both went to the University of Michigan for grad school. And he said, Jim, I, we would love to move back here. We're having our first kid. We think it would be a better place to raise a family. 
uh, but it is just a cooler place to launch businesses out here in the valley. Um, and um, and I, I'd love to have a longer conversation about this, um, but we're not going to, a lot of people say, well, how can we be the next Silicon Valley? And, and people say that all over the country. People say that in Germany. And, you know, and nobody's going to be the next Silicon Valley, so let's not try. Uh, let, let's be the next great Michigan. <laughs> um, and, um, and there are so many reasons why uh, Ben and Julie, uh, we, we could get them to move back here. Um, and... Uh, maybe it's to start his third business, um, and uh, it, it and it's it's to be around family. He they both recognize uh, that. I mean, he offered it. It would be a much better place to raise our kids. Uh, you know what it's like out here, Jim. You've lived here, and and so much went unspoken in that in those two sentences. Uh, so. I think we've got, we've got something there. That it, it, let's let's just say you know nobody's going to be the next Silicon Valley. Let's not try. But we've got we've got stuff. That's a, an academic term. That 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 they're never going to be able to touch. And and that that sort of family centric. Uh, wonderful place to live. I mean, you, you can't touch their weather, fine. Uh, but but there, there are so many things that we've got that they can't touch. Um, let's play to our strengths. <laughs> so there's that whole broad public perception that needs right. to be changed, and you know, you're starting that. You know, well, I, it, it, and certainly part of that is cultural. Yeah. And um, you know, Rick Snyder, uh, when he moved back here years ago, uh, you know, contributed a lot to uh, to that and. It, there have been so many people who have been, you know, I think putting their shoulder to the wheel for years to, to try to, um, to, to make this basically a, a more fun and easier place to start a business and, and make it okay to, I, I tell you, when I moved here in 88 from Boston and before that I lived in, in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area, um, I felt kind of sheepish coming home from my job in the middle of the day to see my little toddler. Why? Because, oh my gosh, I'm getting on a plane tomorrow to head off to Japan and then Korea and then so on for my, my startup software company and I, I miss him. And I'm working, you know, long hours. But I felt sheepish because I, I was worried about what the neighbors would think about, does Jim even have a job? <laughs> so you're absolutely right. I, but that was in, you know, 88, 89, 90, 91. Um, now it's, it, it, the, there's been a complete sea change. I mean, that's ancient history. Now um, it's, it, it, it's cool to be self-employed and, um, and to say you're an entrepreneur. Not everybody understands, uh, but it, there's, so it's gone from uh, uncool to cool to maybe we'll have understanding someday. Yeah, it, well, something that's really interesting is a, a tremendous number of people who, um, Let's see. Every year at the Ross School, we have 500 MBA uh, people in each MBA class. So we have, it's a two-year program, so that's 500 in the first year class, 500 in the second year class. Uh, every year we, we have uh, about 700 people who are engaged in different entrepreneurship 
um, activities, uh, whether they be courses like mine uh, or the Dare to Dream program, thinking about starting a business. The vast majority of those, it, primarily because of student uh, loans and so on, go off and get job jobs. It's kind of hard to argue with the logic. Um, here's the delightful thing, though. I, I, I keep in touch with a, a lot of these folks. Um, they end up applying those entrepreneurial skills at Procter & Gamble, at General Electric, at uh, you know, Pacific Gas & Electric, at Clorox. It, it's remarkable how do they, how uh, it, it's uh, taking the existing product and launching it in South America. It's taking the existing uh, service or product line and launching it with a completely new business or pricing model. Uh, and, and so they have to take those entrepreneurial skills and instead of, of skiing like this, where we, we all stand rigidly and, uh, and you, know, you can kill yourself skiing like that. Uh, you, you have to ski with your knees bent. We teach them how to ski with their knees bent. Stay loose, stay low. We teach them how to fall. It's okay to fall, it's okay to fail. You learn from failure. That's what entrepreneurship is all about. They learn those skills, they, they internalize those skills, and they can apply those in the public sector. They can apply those in, in working creatively, building creative, high-performing teams in the healthcare sector, in almost any sector. And as they, um, as they move through life, I'm finding as I have uh, now 10 years worth of a, a sampling and over a thousand people, they're contacting me not just when they have a baby uh, and so on, but if I work one more day at fill in the blank corporation, I'm going to tear my hair out or my husband or wife just gave me dispensation to quit my day job and I'm ready now. So once they've started to pay down their student loans and they've been applying these entrepreneurship skills in an intrapreneurial inside the corporation setting, the bug doesn't leave them. And indeed, it, gets, it, it grows. And, and they think, you know, here's a cool idea that we could launch ourselves. Thank you, folks. Doesn't it feel good to live in the state of Michigan did he make you proud of Michigan or what? Place making.